Welcome to the CUNY Aviation Executive Speaker Lecture Series. This is our third installment of the series. The first year we started with Dave Bushy, who was the Chief Operating Officer of uh, Cape Air. Uh, last year, some of you joined us for the luncheon that we had with Sue Bear. And this year, we decided to change it up a little bit. We moved it to an evening event. And many of the students know that this is AKA Family Night. And so we have invited the students to invite friends and family to this evening. And we are going to continue the executive speaker series with a panel. And um, what I'd like to do is, uh, I know I invited you to eat. Um, so that we can keep the program moving, but I'm going to ask you to just give a moment to a recent graduate, um, Gabriel Claxe, and Stefan Kishore, who is also a recent graduate, and they are going to give us the national anthem and the invocation. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets for the invocation. Provost Griffith, Assistant Provost Henke, Senior Vice President Postman, Dean Rosen, Director Aceves, Director Hodge, honored guest, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, I've been called today to bring you the prayers for the invocation. Let us pray. God, we this diverse group of your servants have gathered here to witness this meeting of minds of these professionals and leaders of industry commerce, and education. God, I ask that you watch over them always. Guide them when they make their choices and decisions, for their choices affect so many. God, I ask that you protect and watch over our students, our future leaders who are standing before you today. God, these are our future presidents, governors, mayors, aviation industry CEOs, managers, and directors. I ask that you bless each of them as they move toward their respective dreams. And when they have attained them, let them become great leaders, leaders who will lead with integrity as this school has taught and will continue to teach them. And let them remember to support, remember the support, love, and the compassion they have received here so that they will reciprocate for the future generations to come. Finally, God, I offer these words of thanks to all those who have worked so hard to make this afternoon possible. Amen. Thank you, Gabrielle and Stefan. Please continue to enjoy your salad as we progress uh, through the program. 
As I said um, earlier, this is a little change for us in the series. We are going to do a panel discussion, and you'll learn a little bit more about the panelists later, but um, I wanted to let you know who they were. Our moderator for the evening is Philippa Carteron, who is the director of the Council for Airport Opportunity. I can tell you, Philippa and I go way back. Uh, I met her probably about the second week I started working here, and I think I've talked to her every week since that, since then, um, and we've worked very well together on um, doing all kind of projects, both for uh, the aviation program as well as other college projects because she does serve on a number of the boards at the college. Um, also on the panel is Miss Patty Clark. Miss Patty Clark is coming to us from the Port Authority and um, Patty and I recently got to know each other. I think last January we met at a conference. Um, actually the students brought us together and over the summer I saw quite a bit of Patty as I visited the Port Authority while the interns were uh, working there this summer. And she did a great job, I must say, mentoring uh, Veronica Carpio, who has worked with me for the last three years. You know, I thought I taught everything she needed to know, and then Patty went and taught her more stuff. I don't really understand how that happened. but um, So that was a good uh, summer, and we're really happy to have Patty with us tonight. Um, many of you may know um, that we have a new director of the Aviation Institute, Dr. Robert Aceves. And uh, Dr. Aceves comes to us from the cold Minnesota town of St. Cloud. Um, and he has gotten here and has thrown himself into this thing we call New York and CUNY and York and aviation here in this wonderful town and has done a valiant job and has great things planned for the Institute going forward. And and um, our final panelist is Isima Gibbs. And um, she also I met probably hmm, six, seven weeks into uh, coming to York. And uh, we have worked together to make a lot of the things possible uh, for the students uh, to experience outside of New York. And I would like, because just this very morning, just this very morning, 16 representatives of your college were flown back from Orlando um, on JetBlue, all on the same flight. And those of you who've studied your revenue accounting know that that's a big deal to take 16 seats out of revenue service uh, on your airplane and um, flew them down and flew them back. Um, in time for today's event, and I'd like for us to give her a big round of applause for that. And as I said later on, you'll hear more about them from our moderator, Philippa Carteron. Now I'd like to um, bring up some of the college's executive staff to bring greetings to the group. Um, Dr. Keyes, regrettably, had, was called away to another appointment, uh, so we're going to go directly to, do I see the provost here? Provost is here? Yes. Our provost, Dr. Ivalor Griffith, who has been with us now, going, this is your third year now already? Our third year, and uh, coincidentally, you know, this is, the aviation degree has been operating for about three years, so basically it's been operating under his uh, purview, and he has been very supportive and has helped us to do all the things that we've been doing, and I'd like to welcome him to the podium at this time to bring some greeting. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We've got food, we have energy, we have life. I'm just going to take two minutes of your time to do three things. And the first thing is to welcome you, to welcome you, especially if you're here only for the first time as a member of the family of one of our students, a member of the family of one of our 
faculty and member of the family of one of our staff. But I'd also like to specially welcome Dr. Aceves and his family because as an institution that's on the move where leadership is critical to that movement and to that development, we value the energy, the insights, the leadership that Bob Aceves will bring and he promised me he'll bring all those things. I've got it in a record. I've got it in a tape. Uh, we want to have him feel that he is welcome to enter this family with his family. And we're delighted to have him feel at home as he helps us all to be on the move, not only to walk or to crawl, but to fly. That's item number one. The, the second thing that I'd like to do is to mention two little letters. I'm not going to mention all three. I tend to like to speak about three letters of the alphabet. And this year, I've been talking about opportunities, ownership, and outcomes. But if you'll allow me, I'll just mention two of those three O's. The O that relates to opportunities and the O that relates to outcomes. York is all about opportunities for educational growth. The Aviation Institute, the aviation program, is all about opportunities for educational growth. But we're not simply about opportunities as ends in themselves. We're interested in opportunities that would lead to outcomes. You'd get a degree, you'd get a job, you go to graduate school, you go to professional school, you professionally and socially and economically develop yourselves. So think of this as an opportunities program. Think of this as an outcomes program. But keep in mind that for opportunities to be translated into outcomes, You've got the letter F that needs to figure in that equation. Family is critical. Family is critical to support you while you're in college pursuing the educational opportunities. Even if it's only to provide you space so you're not disturbed, so you can study and be successful. And family is even more crucial once you get the job or get graduate school, once you have those outcomes from college, because hopefully you're not going to be hermits once you graduate. You're going to be actively engaged social contributors to the society. You're going to want to build or extend your own families. And I'd want you to keep in mind that the value of the theme is not simply a value related to tonight's event. Family is critical to all that we do, whether you are in college, or whether you are out of college, getting a job, going to graduate school. So let me do my final act by saying, before you leave this evening, thinking of this as a family, make sure you meet another member of the family who you have not yet come to know. Make sure you meet someone from another table Build a family connection as part of the aviation family. Build the connection as part of the York family. Because you might be able to help someone in a year or two from now in the educational opportunities part of the journey or in the outcomes part of the journey, helping to facilitate that person getting a job, helping to facilitate that you get a job because of the connections you make here this evening. So make sure you meet, before you leave, another member of the York Aviation family who you have not been introduced to as yet. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Griffith. Next, I'd like uh, for a recent addition to the York team to come up and bring some greetings. He is not only a recent addition to York, but he's also a part of the team that's dedicated to making sure that aviation is successful. 
Dean Harry Rosen comes to us uh, from a distinguished career with Baruch College, and he has come to be the dean of our new School of Business and Information Systems, which we just reorganized the college into three schools, and he's the dean of one of them. And that is the school where the CUNY Aviation Institute resides, and also the school where the Bachelor of Science in Aviation Management reside. So I'd like to bring Dean Harry Rosen to the podium to bring a few words of greeting. Rochelle, thank you very much. Um, first of all, for my family, I got to give a salute to the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, my, uh, my nephew is a Navy fighter pilot. So we got a few things in common. Uh, he just does it on these things that are bobbing around in the Pacific Ocean. I don't know how he does that, but you'll tell me that later, gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Honored to be with you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, the aviation program has been such a wonderful introduction for me to York College. I met so many of you at, at the retreat back in the Poconos. Um, that's rare. Uh, Dean's got a lot of administrative stuff to do. And you accorded me that, and, and accorded me that opportunity, and I want to thank you all for that, and, and, uh, and express my gratitude. Um, I want to tell you a couple things that I, I want to do with, with the School of Business, and I think the Aviation Institute is, is leading the way. I want to have more affinity groups. I want the people who are majoring in finance to begin to have some of the camaraderie and the closeness and the family atmosphere that you've shown the way to. Um, I want them to sponsor events like this where, Ms. Gibbs, we're going to talk about corporate ethics and accountability. That's going to be an important theme of where we go, and you're leading the way in that again. Um, the theme of that retreat, as you all know, but you, your family don't, well, may not know, was leadership. Another theme that I hope to bring here. We can train people to be leaders. We can't take Homer Simpson and turn him into Napoleon, but we can teach each and every one of you to be better leaders, and you've shown the way on that again. Um, this is a very competent group, and so I, I will leave you with Rosen's three rules when dealing with competent people. The first rule is support them every way you can. The second rule is stay the heck out of their way, yeah, I cleaned that up a little bit. And the last rule is take credit for everything they do. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Rosen. Um, I didn't introduce myself earlier, I don't think. Uh, I am Michelle Hodge, Director of, Project, of the Project Management Office, and I have um, had various roles with the Aviation Institute over the last, I guess, four years. I've had special projects, I've had uh, outreach, I've been director once and administrator once, and it really has been um, one of the best times in my life to deal with this program. Um, and the person I want to bring up to talk to you next is um, my boss, who through most of that time has been flexible enough with me to be able to uh, do aviation duties as well as administrative duties as, desi as designated by my actual title. And um, he is, I think, one of the biggest supporters on campus, along with the speakers you already heard, for the aviation program. And he wanted to uh, stay on a Friday night and I'm very honored that he did that, uh, to speak to you a little bit uh, about the aviation program and kind of what he sees as an administrator uh, the program is like. So I'd like to bring up Vice President Jerry Poseman. You cannot recognize enough the Tuskegee Airmen. Bill Wheeler, Victor Terrellon, two gentlemen that we have worked with all along and we will continue to work with. 
and we show our appreciation of their efforts. And that will be a permanent appreciation one day at your college that people will come to visit. Um, a long time ago in, uh, in graduate school, uh, someone said to the class that I was in that one of the purposes of higher education was the ability to ask questions. And then they paused and they said, hopefully intelligent questions. So I am going to pose a question and then I'm going to give you the answer. The question is, why York? Part of my role is recruitment. I'm in charge of enrollment. And when we go out, the university, City University is a vast place. There are 18 colleges out there. And when our recruiters go out and they approach college counselors and guidance counselors and students and parents and teachers, the question comes up, if you're in business, why York rather than Baruch? If you're in the health professions, why York rather than Hunter? If you're in the liberal arts, why York rather than Queens? It's a really good question. And it's a question that we have begun to answer over the last couple of years, and we'll continue to answer. But the answer really is right here. There is no better answer than what is in this room today with the aviation program. Now, I wasn't supposed to speak because my friend and colleague, Mr. Hodge, thought that the provost, Mr. Rosen, the president, was supposed to be here. But he made the mistake last night, around 6.30 at night. He called me into his office, and he said, I want to show you something. And what he wanted to show me was a little montage of photos that was put together about the aviation program going back three and a half years. And I looked at this, and I said, put me on the agenda. Because what you're going to see on these two screens in a moment is why this program is a model program both at York and at City University and any institution of higher education in this country. This is a unique program. What students have had in this program, they will not get any other place. Any other place. Because what you're going to see on the screen, and the images go quickly, and they're not simply for display purposes. You're going to see internships. You're going to see flight familiarization programs. You're going to see visits to industrial sites. You're going to see a leadership program taking place. You're going to see club activity. What has happened with this aviation program, which was very, very difficult, my friend Philip Carteron knows this, how difficult it was to start this program, the battles we had to do this, it is now reaching maturity. It's in its fourth year, and finally we'll be graduating our first group of students. But I want you to watch carefully what's on this screen, because what's on these screens now indicates why the students in this program, no matter where they would have gone for aviation or any other discipline, could not get what was gotten here during these three and a half years. So simply, that's my message. This is the Vanguard program, hopefully for York, hopefully for the university, and a lesson to be learned for higher education throughout the country. Cue the tape.
right, so as you can see, over the last three and a half years, they've been a busy group. And so right now, we'd like to um, continue uh, with the program, but with the eating portion of the program, which I know everybody's looking forward to. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to ask a couple of tables to go have their uh, chant at the buffet, and then I'll come around and uh, give people the high sign that it's time that they can go to the buffet. That way you can stay at the tables, talk. Uh, please, during this time, mingle, go meet some of the other people who are here, part of other parts of the family. And um, uh, after everybody has gotten their first course, we'll have another little uh, piece of entertainment for you provided by our students. So I'm going to ask the uh, table, the president's table and the provost table to start us off. There's a buffet on this side and there's a buffet on the rear of the room there. Um, if we could go ahead and start with those two tables and then I'll come along and let people know when it's a good time for them to go so that they don't stand online too long. Thank you. Uh, entertainment provided by two of our aviation students. Aviation students are very talented, multi-talented. They do all kinds of things on campus. And actually, uh, these two gentlemen behind me, Jose and Sergio, are new to the campus, really. Uh, Sergio is a freshman, first semester freshman, and got involved right away. We called him to go to leadership before he even uh, started at the college, and he came out. and. He's uh, been a phenomenal addition to the team, as well as Jose, who's in his first semester as a transfer student, who just graduated with his associate's degree. So we should give him a, both of a round of applause for graduating from high school and their associates and coming to join us. Uh, they are going to do a little spoken word and art here for us. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Sergio and Jose. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Sergio Sanchez, like Mr. Haas introduced me. This is my friend, Jose. And tonight we have, I have a poem to tell you. Um, basically, we took a lot of time and dedication to write this out and plan this event out. I really do hope that you like it. Just know that this came from our hearts to yours. Here I stand forever looking up at this endless blessing from God that is the sky, reminiscing about the times when I was young, and everywhere I go, I was always asked where I wanted to go and who I wanted to become. Un I'm sorry, a little nervous, forgive me. Here I stand, forever looking up at this endless blessing from God that is the sky, reminiscing about the times when I was young. And everywhere I was go, I was always asked where I wanted to go and who I wanted to become. But the answer to these questions was always unclear. And I tried to clear my thoughts from these voices in my head that I hear, slowly convincing me to chase these meaningless careers that are passionless. But here I stand, passionless, until the day that I heard a sharp cry over my head and fell breathless, almost in a trance, as I see the shark transforming right before my eyes, and it was beautiful. And, I, and there I stood, listening to the deafening roar of its four engines flying over my head, watching as the three sets of landing gears appear from the shark's insides, staring at the shark, using its fins, skillfully carving a path in the skies like a full court press. But I must confess that suddenly I am consumed by a raging fire inside, feeling like a cup filled to the brim, about to overflow with feelings that I cannot describe. But here I am feeling the development of this passion that is growing into this new kind of obsession to fly my own shark in the sky. Yes, I have an obsession to fly. So that one day I could become a captain working in my own airlines. And here I stand, knowing that this is the dream that I cannot hold inside, that I cannot allow society to stick me in a box and call this my destiny, for I am powerful. And fueled by this passion for flight that fills me, I have no choice but to think outside the box until I and the box are one. So I have to think outside myself. So until I complete my fantasies, which one day will become reality, and still I stand, forever looking up at this endless blessing from God that is the sky. And whoever tells you that fish cannot fly, 
My friends, they tell you lies. Thank you. Take a bow. All right, that was a very good. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, now we can continue with our table uh, chatting. And uh, those of you who like some seconds on the buffet, please, I think it's all on this buffet now. Please feel free to go and have a little more and we'll set up for the panel. Thank you. All right, everyone. I'm going to show you all a little trick now. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with leader shape, I'm going to show you a little trick right now. Ready? Leader shape. Leader shape. Leader shape. Leader shape uh, was, you saw some of the pictures in the uh, montage there. Actually, this was a little way we used to get people's attention because after being together for six days, 24 hours a day, people got a little cabin fever. And so <laughs> it was hard for them to sometimes come to attention. So whenever we wanted to uh, get the group's attention, we'd say leader shape. Hey. <laughs> Patty beat you to it, see? You see how, you see how infectious it is? So, um, but of course we came back and there's more uh, students that uh, joined us um, that weren't able to go to leadership for one reason or the other. So I hope that soon uh, we will change that uh, leadership to something else that everybody can respond to in a uh, common uh, ground and a common experience. But I will leave that up to you guys to figure out what that is. Okay, so now that I have your attention, and I showed you my skills of getting people's attention. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to uh, the panel and uh, its moderator, Philippa Carteron, and I'm going to introduce Philippa. Um, I don't have enough time up here to tell you about the experiences I've had with Philippa Carteron over the last almost four years. Um, we met uh, across a conference room table when she was working for the Department of Small Business Services. And um, it was an interesting meeting because uh, it was somewhat spirited and Philippa and I were spectators. And uh, we figured maybe we were the only sane ones in the room. And so we bonded over the sanity and have been uh, planning and working together ever since. And um, I probably don't have a bigger supporter in the community or at the college. Uh, quite often I look at my paycheck and it has this little deduction. I was trying to figure out what it was. So I went to, the, to uh, payroll and payroll said, we've never seen this before. I said, go to HR. So I went to HR and they said, don't you know? You have to pay commission for all that PR you're getting. You have to, you have to pay Philippa Carter on for that. I really <laughs> <laughs> um, And that left with my son. <laughs> And so, uh, uh, but you know, uh, I, I really, I really wish it, I did have a little deduction uh, to give her every week because I swear every week she's out there uh, trying to to help me, and mainly trying to help me because she knows that helping me helps the students and the program at your college. Uh, she serves on the president's advisory board. She serves on the CUNY Aviation Institute's advisory board. She was on the search committee that brought us the provost. Uh, she has been uh, involved with the college since they were marching to put the college here. And for those of you who don't know about the college, being it at, uh, in Jamaica, Queens, uh, it, uh, it took a lot of effort by a lot of people. And uh, Philippa Carteron was one of those people. And if you have a chance uh, and you're on YouTube, please look for Robert Parmet, who gave a lecture on the origins of York just a few uh, weeks ago. And it'll be very informational, and you'll know that Philippa Carteron was one of the pioneers that brought the college to the community. There are a lot of other things I can tell you about her, but um, I want to give her a chance to come up here and tell maybe a story, one short story about herself, and then introduce the rest of the panel. So I'd like to welcome to the podium Philippa Carteron.
Well, after that introduction, that wasn't exactly the introduction that I thought Michelle was going to give you. The one that says that I'm really only 29, so I don't know <laughs> what you think you're talking about. So. But uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to be here this evening. Uh, seeing you here is the culmination of a dream for any number of us, including Patty Clark and I see Gibbs. These are my colleagues, uh, you know, my ground crew, if you will. Uh, as we have looked at a vision and seen it come to fruition in each and every one of you. Uh, this program is absolutely my heart. It grew out of an opportunity uh, that is going to be part of a little story that I'm going to tell you uh, this evening. Very short story, but I'm going to hit a couple of points. I want to take this opportunity to thank Michelle Hodge for giving me this opportunity to be with you today. I'm going to talk quickly about Philippa's, thank you, Philippa's aviation journey. My aviation journey started with my first plane ride. And believe it or not, that was when I was in my teens and went out to my husband's homecoming at the University of Toledo. I'm sure that's very different than a lot of people's stories here, especially the young people who probably started out when their parents carried them on the plane. So mine started in my teens, and one of the most exciting things about that, um, a number of my colleagues here would appreciate this, and some of the young women in the uh, audience, was I got to plan what I was going to wear, and I'll tell you that I had on a white corduroy suit for my first plane ride. <laughs> so that's what I remember, not necessarily the plane ride itself, but the white corduroy suit. I uh, had another opportunity, a missed opportunity that many of you have had the opportunity to realize. There was an opportunity for me to take flight lessons. And I cannot tell you to this day what happened and why I did not take them. Uh, one of the pioneers in uh, aviation, particularly in this area, offered f to be my mentor in flying. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. So I, I, every time you guys go up in the air, I'm going up with you. Now, the last part of my journey is, has several segments, and it's a 23-year journey with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It started in partnership. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, prior to my current job, I was with the City of New York for 31 years, and during that time, I had phenomenal opportunities. But I think the greatest opportunity that brought me to where I am today was my partnership uh, with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. During that period, I had several different highlights. One of the major highlights, and, 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 and probably uh, the most influential one in my career, was being commissioned uh, by Patty Clark's colleague, Cruz Russell, uh, to run and administer the aviation uh, train recruitment. And we did that as the demonstration project for the Workforce One Career Center, which some of you are familiar with, right down the street on Jamaica Avenue. I had the privilege of actually opening that center and opening the system, the Workforce Investment System, uh, for the city of New York. And what could have been a better demonstration project than the air train project? And we absolutely met our goals. The idea was to make sure that people from this community and Queens and New York at large had an opportunity to participate in this wonderful, great project that was coming uh, to this side of the ocean, if you will. There had been some in London and other places, Turkey, but nothing here in the United States. And as I said, we met our goal. 86% of those persons hired, and many of them are still on board, came from the 114. And as you know, the airport is in the 114. 90% came from Queens, and the rest came from the greater New York metropolitan area. So it was a privilege, and that was when I first met my colleague, Patty Clark. And uh, you know, we all worked diligently to bring that project. Why is that important to you guys? Well, it was the air train project that allowed the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to give the initial funds that uh, created the air train project. And we've been coming ever since. As uh, Vice President Posman said, it has not 
been an easy journey. And if we had not all stuck the course and then had the privilege of having persons like Michelle Hodge, Jerry Posman, Eve Law Griffith, and certainly President Keyes come on board, we would not all be here tonight enjoying each other's company. So I want to give those persons a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, the, the last thing in my journey that I want to talk about is that I am now the executive director of the Council for Airport Opportunity. So that journey from that first plane ride in my white corduroy suit brought me here tonight in my new role that began uh, the end of April as the executive director for Council Airport Opportunity, as I mentioned to you. Council for Airport Opportunity is actually funded by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and its airline partners. Uh, so for me, I, I mean, it is a dream come true. It is absolutely the icing on the cake. And every single student in this room has the opportunity to realize that kind of dream. And we are here to support you in those endeavors. And the last thing I'm going to say about my journey was that I somehow, Ms. Gibbs and Ms. Clark, had to hit the ground running. And that would not have been possible if I had not had Aviation Institute interns over the course of the summer. They were invaluable. 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 I'd like to ask Novalette Brown. Uh, Novalette. OK. And I don't know if Devon Phillips is here. OK. And Tokan Bu is, please stand, is my last intern. He's with me now. But I haven't let Novalette and Devon get away. Uh, some of the assignments that have come from my colleagues, uh, they are actually assisting me with. So again, it gives me great pleasure to be here as your moderator tonight to see the dream continue. Thank you. <laughs> with that, uh, I have the pleasure, again, to introduce uh, my colleague, Patty Clark, who is a senior advisor to the Aviation Director for External Affairs. Patty began her career in public service as a 17-year-old worker on Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan's first campaign in 1976. She then worked in both his New York City and Washington offices, focusing on priority projects such as Homeport, the preservation of Fort Totten, and was responsible for legislative issues concerning housing and the homeless. Following her tenure in Washington, she commenced a career in education and government and community relations. She was the Director of Development and Government and Community Relations at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, and then ha held the same title at the New York School for the Deaf. Wow. She joined the Port Authority's Airport Access Program in 1995 and helped to secure funding from the FAA and to gain all the necessary community and governmental approvals for Newark and JFK air train projects. She is currently the Senior Advisor to the Aviation Director for External Affairs. In 1998, she received the Port Authority's Executive Director's Award for securing FAA approval for the JFK air train. In 1999, Women in Construction named Patty one of that year's Women of Achievement. And in 2000, she, along with many colleagues, received the Port Authority's unit citation for successfully managing the agency's uniform land use procedure, better known to most of us as ULERP, application. The Association for Minority Enterprises of New York, AMNI, honored her with their 2002 Public Service Award. Patty is married and has a very handsome and lovely son named Ian. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Patty Clark. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you, Michelle. I, I have to just take one moment to thank you for bringing the most wonderful, engaging, dynamic, and infectious group of interns to the Port Authority. Um, Bill Dakota got to spend a little time with them when they did their presentations at the end of the summer, and I have never seen him more proud. He, he sat there and he just, one by one, he just, the grin on his face got bigger. Uh, the students just are wonderful, and I, I love them. 
So I, I had to write my speech down. And it's not a speech, but because I'm older than I seem, I can't see and I don't remember anything. So I will go from there. Um, well, I always do my best to do anything that Verona asks me to do. I, I have to admit I was reluctant to accept the invitation. How could I talk about balancing a career in aviation and a family as I'm far more novice at motherhood than I am at an employeehood? I keep thinking to myself that the jury is still out on whether I've, I've indeed succeeded managing this balance. The proof will be when my now nine-year-old son, Ian, reaches maturity and hasn't written a Mommy Dearest book. But I told Veronica that I would do it, and I set about pulling my presentation together the same way I would address any other, other presentation or challenge that I'm presented with. I sought input from experts, in this case, my colleagues. I sent an email to a handful of my colleagues who represent a variety of roles in aviation, deputy general managers, operation managers, senior management, HR, finance, environmental, security, external affairs. Some of them work at the airport. Some of them have more nine to five jobs in, in a, the office downtown. Some have biz, business obligations that takes them out a few ni nights a week, like myself. Some have one child, some have eight. Um, some have children younger than Ian. One's the mother of two teenage girls. And yet there's a single dad of a grown, independent, quite successful young woman. And so you'll get the collective advice from all of them. The email I sent read like this. Verona Corpio, one of my York interns, asked to me to participate in a panel discussion at York on balancing being in the aviation business and having a family. Aside from saying the obvious, like marry a saint, like I did, I would honestly appreciate your insights into how you do it. And I have to say at the onset that I did, in fact, marry a saint. Uh, my husband, Neil, and I'm glad he's not here because I wouldn't be able to say this, but my husband, Neil, is special. and and. Men like him do not come along every day. And he, while he's an equal partner and he shares responsibility for Ian's child care and child rearing, and those are not the same things. Uh, we share obligations demanded by our house. We share financially contribute to the family. But the neatest part about my Neil is that he relishes his time with Ian and he loves his role as dad. And Ian is not an obligation, but rather a source of joy. And we share that sentiment together. But in as much as we love our son to death, neither of us would be employed or have our sanity if it weren't for an excellent and reliable childcare and a flexible and understanding work environment. And I was lucky enough to have both and do have both. My career at the Port Authority, is, as Philippa mentioned, began in 1995, working on what was to become the air train, overseeing the planning outreach efforts, monumental task. I was working 13 hours a day. And after all the funding and the approvals had been uh, secured and the project was being constructed, I was asked, Patty, we have this little job for you. Mayor Giuliani is trying to take over control of the airports, and um, would you stop him? And so <laughs> that was my next job, where long hours, late nights, all the while having the time of my life. I, I love my job. And then there came that fateful day when I had to tell Bill Dakota, a man many of you know, a man of, and if you know me, you know that I love him dearly as a boss and, and as a treasured friend. I had to tell him I was pregnant. And I will be very honest with you, it was easier for me to tell him that I had breast cancer than it was for me to tell him I was pregnant. He, he sat there and said, oh, you know, this is the very verbose man who was never at a loss for words. He just kept saying, isn't that something? <laughs> That's really something. And all the while in his head, I know he's saying, She's not going to come back. Oh, my God, do you think she can actually stay home when she has this kid and she's not going to work long hours? And you know what? And all of those things were swirling in my head, too. And it was kind of scary because I was always very a career person, and how was I going to make this juggle? But fast forward, I came back to work. I didn't get soft. I, all right, I didn't work 13 hours. I only worked 9 or 10 and work longer when I have to. But and I wasn't around to talk to Bill at 8.30 at night, but I used to talk to him on the phone at 6 o'clock in the morning. So Bill was happy. And Bill, as it turned out, was the biggest baby himself. He used to crawl around on all fours when Ian was little, and he'd, he'd have a stash. He literally had a stash of coins in his office that he would give when kids came in to visit. He would give and say, here, don't tell your mother. Go to the vending machine and buy candy. So, <laughs> but, so the... But as it turned out, the having the baby was the easy part. So Neil and I didn't, we don't have family locally. And so we had to find quality, reliable childcare. And it, it's also a fact of life that you have to be able to afford it. We had, had this situation where we found a woman while I was still pregnant, 
She was wonderful. We loved her. She came when Ian was first born. She loved Ian. We loved her. Everything it was, we offered her what we thought was a very generous deal. And she said, you know, I really want to do this, but I have one more interview. I just want to go through the motions. And that night she came back. She was in tears. She said, I, I don't know what to do. Um, they offered me, and the, the salary was take home 45% more than we were offering her. They were offering her health care, and then they, she could start immediately. And, and by start, that meant they were going to start paying her immediately. The child wasn't due for four months. So I'm like, well, you have a good time because we can't really match that. And, and you have this moment of panic that now what do I do? But we did find a wonderful, wonderful woman who met Ian when she he was three weeks old and stayed with us until he was a, an established kindergartner. And now we have a couple, it's a family friend, who, uh, husband and wife, who are an unofficial aunt and uncle, who, who are former educators. And so as he's grown and his needs are different, I can't do his math, I can't help him in math, it's way beyond me, they're good at it. So this is, it's been a great and wonderful marriage. Uh, from, so that's how, that's how I do it. I have a dedicated partner, a reliable, dependable childcare, a backup network, uh, family, when and where they can help, a flexible work environment, and a good sense of humor. But I would like to tell you some of the advice that my colleagues gave, because I think it's actually, it's, it's very interesting. One senior member out at JFK, uh, at LaGuardia rather, said, I have to say that as a single dad, I could not have succeeded raising my child without leaning rather heavily on my own parents while I pursued my enriching Port Authority career. In my own defense, even though my parents essentially raised her, I made the effort to remain engaged and positive and encouraging force in my daughter's life, whether it was church, school, sports, or socializing. Of course, I have to butt out in recent years since she's 23 now. It came natural, but I always had to hug and kiss her at every opportunity, and I still do. I try to instill in her all the blessings in life, family, liberty, intelligence, beauty, come from her creator, and to thank God every day for them, and to always help others in need. Fortunately, my family is very close, and together we helped my daughter build a solid foundation. She was a top student all the way through college, is three quarters of the way to getting her CPA, and has a good job with an accounting firm in New York City. She also has a steady boyfriend. He's a good kid, and I've decided to let him live. <laughs> uh, here's another one from uh, mother of two teenage girls. Heavy drinking is a must. Actually, <laughs> Actually, the most distressing part of working in parenthood is that most of the time I don't really think I've got it right, and that I'm really in no position to advise anybody else. It's like diving into the pool. When you get in there, you just close your eyes and you keep paddling, otherwise you'd surely sink. But you don't really know if you're going to make it back to the other side of the pool safely. Now that my daughters are teenagers, I really have that feeling a lot more than I did when they were younger. Right now, the other side of the pool seems many miles away. The mother of two grown daughters told me to tell you, throw money at it. When I was pregnant with my first child, my husband and I decided to invest in a two-family house with my parents. My mother agreed to quit her job and take care of my daughter. First of all, we got a better house than I would have on our own, and it was better, if you can't have yourself raise your child, who's better than your own mother? You don't have to, you do have to give up certain things in this arrangement, privacy for one, and it's also really hard to tell the sitter that she's wrong. In, an, in another one, another colleague said, start each of your day with the notion that you will disappoint someone. Just figure out who you can afford to disappoint with the least amount of damage to yourself. And once you realize that you can't really do it all, it makes it easier to cope with what's on your plate. One of our attorneys told us the following, some day you balance really well and other days you just do a really crappy job. You just hope that at the end of the day, the scales are tipping in your favor. And one of our operational managers, who's married to a woman who's also in the aviation industry, wrote the following. I believe the jury's still out on whether me or my wife as parents have succeeded, even though two of our kids are now in college and the youngest is 11. But as I read your topic, I immediately thought of my wife. We will celebrate 23 years of marriage on Saturday and are very much still in love. I say this because I believe it's been tremendously important to have a loving, caring structure for the family or especially the children. They see us interact and hopefully learn, but also realize the worth. It's been difficult, but we have remained focused on the kids and their lives. We make the time to be with them, do things with them, and more importantly, communicate with them. 
I also believe the passion that my, both my wife and I have shown in our careers uh, and our interests are the f and fairly successful fruits of our labors has sparked an interest with the kids. We've always brought them to the extent possible with us so the kids share our common interest in aviation. We've both made sacrifices with our career, but we, because we remained focused on the family, yeah, it meant late nights catching up on sleep and passing the kids off in the driveway when we worked opposite ships. But when you got right down to it, it was nothing was completely right, but we got most of it right, and the kids really make everything else down the road go smoother. Careers and family, probably the two most important investments we make, and so they take hard work and monitoring to ensure success. I've been fortunate enough to have succeeded in finding work or career in an industry I love and enjoy, and also blessed with having found the woman to spend a lifetime with. Hope some of this helps, and hopes that I, that I think back and realize just how difficult it's been. I smile and realize the investment was completely worth it. Amazing. <laughs> and so that's the kind of help I've been privileged to have. I'd also like to say that Blake is a student uh, in CUNY, but he works here at York on Fridays. And Andrew um, is a graduate of York College who graduated on the dean's list. So thank you, guys. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to say I also have a daughter and a husband. And again, if you really need to have your significant others uh, be supportive of what it is that you want to do with your life and in your career. So I am very, very blessed in that regard. With that, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Isima Gibbs. Isima is currently the director of Corporate Social Responsibility at JetBlue Airways, and what better person for that job? Isima Gibbs uh, was, now works uh, for the Low Fare Airlines Forest Hills New York Support Center. Ms. Gibbs is responsible for coordinating participation in community and charitable activities, philanthropy projects, and social responsibility pro programs throughout JetBlue's network. Ms. Gibbs is also responsible for representing the airline at a variety of public functions related to community-based activities and does that extraordinarily well. Ms. Gibbs has been with JetBlue since before the airline took flight, joining in August 1999 as director of JFK operations. I had the privilege of meeting her when she was the station manager for JetBlue at JFK. And there is no more hardworking and very, very capable uh, director than she was in that job. The job she's doing now is invaluable to the community at large, our greater U.S. community, if you will, but she did a, excuse me, bang-up job when she was out of JFK. Okay. <laughs> Uh, she started her aviation career with People Express after graduating from Syracuse University with a degree in broadcast journalism. Ms. Gibbs joined Continental after People Express merged with Continental in 1985. Ms. Gibbs took on roles of increasing responsibility, finally serving as Director of Customer Service with a specific focus on Continental's international operations. Ms. Gibbs is a board member of the Aviation Institute at York College, as well as the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation and the Council of Airport Opportunity. Remember I told you she was one of those people that have, you know, my feet to the, you know, metal, to the pedal, right? <laughs> Additionally, she serves on the board of Do Something, a national not-for-profit web-based company that inspires and supports young people changing the world. A native of Queens, New York, where she lives today with her daughter, Miss Gibbs has yet to meet a roller coaster that she wouldn't ride, and I'll attest to that. With that, I'd like to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Isima Gibbs. Good evening. Um, first, I'd like to thank York College and the Aviation Institute. I am so proud of what the Aviation Institute has become because for a while we weren't sure what was going to happen. It's been, um, I think as most of you know, it's been a, a long road, but anything worth fighting, worth having is worth fighting for. And so you guys make me very proud and I am so privileged to be part of the Institute. To Michelle, um, who calls me and says, I see my can you? And I tr always try to say yes. You didn't tell me I'd have to stand up. You knew if I was sitting down, I'd you know, take the job. But uh, here I am in front of a podium. 
speaking to you all, so we'll talk about that a little later, Michelle. Um, when I was asked to talk about balancing the demands of aviation and family, and I was telling, similar to what Patty did, I talked to some of my colleagues for a few different reasons. One, because we had recently celebrated, um, did a lot of diversity initiatives at work, and one of the things that we did was talk about women in aviation and women balancing family. And we did um, a series of lectures and had some of our senior leadership speak about that. And so when I told people that I was coming to talk about that, they kind of chuckled because I don't necessarily do always do a really good job at the balancing, um, as, especially individually. I do a great job collectively because I think as a provost said, family is important. Family isn't always blood, but it's important. And you can't do it alone. When we were Putting our panels together, a lot of the women speaking talked about the need to reach out to people even when it was uncomfortable because they would need help in the journey. From our, our legal team to some of our frontline people, and especially our frontline people who have to deal with irregular operations and thinking they were leaving the airport at 9 and might not leave until 9 the next day, you really have to build a broad network to be successful. So in getting some information and some dialogue from, for some of my um, colleagues, one of the things that I found, or one common thread I found was network, asking, and depending. And sometimes when you ask, you kind of don't depend, but it's important to depend on people because that helps them be accountable, but it gives you a little peace. Balancing, aviation doesn't close at nine, it doesn't end on Christmas or Hanukkah. People fly every day of the year. So you've chosen a career that does not lend itself to a lot of time off. And when I graduated from Syracuse, I was going to work in the airline industry for a few years and then go get a real job. That was my thought. And um, when I graduated in, in that year, um, I started the aviation road and anybody who's in aviation will tell you that once it gets in your blood it stays there and so I've been on this journey for a long time working at JetBlue however has been probably the most challenging thing that I've done because I've done so many different things when you're starting an airline from scratch you have nothing of course and so the canvas that we use to create the wonderful airline that is JetBlue um, came with a lot of hours and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. The interesting thing is that I was single without a child when I started my career in aviation. And like Patty, when I told my boss that I was pregnant, when he picked himself up off of the floor, um, he, he did the same thing. He was, that's really good. That's good. That's so great. And men don't really have to face that. That's very, because, you know, somebody else carries a child and you come to work every day and you, you know, you have the opportunity to take time off. But people don't usually think that you're not coming back. And there's a fear when you start your family that you are going to disappear into some family hole and never come back out. But the fact of the matter is that most of us really enjoy our careers. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of us feel that you can do both. You just have to have some help. Um, and I tell everybody, my view is you can have it all, just probably not at the same time. And if you're good with that, then you really learn how to balance. Sometimes you eat the bear and sometimes the bear eats you. But every day you come back and you try to give it your best shot. Um, when I was working at Kennedy, of course it was a 24-7 job. To this day I still sleep with my Blackberry by my bed. Um, but that's because the airport and the airline never sleeps. I'm at corporate now, so I'm away from home a lot because I manage all of our, our um, corporate social responsibility throughout the country. But I have created, a net, and I'm an only child, but I have created a network of people who love me and love my child, and that really is how I've been able to succeed. So as you are launching your career with your families by your side, it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to help you with your career. So there could be, there's a little, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, and in parentheses somewhere it says, and for those people in aviation. You will not be able to do this by yourself, and it will really take the 
the entire community to help make your dreams come true. One of the things that I think, especially for the women um, in the audience, one of the things that I want you to know is that a strong woman loves her family and takes care of them. And that doesn't mean that you ever have to be apologetic for that in corporate America. People just have to understand that the basis of a family and the foundation of a family is what you have to maintain. That's our jobs. And as we maintain that, don't apologize for that. Take care of the family. It's very, very, very important. But be able to do your job to the best of your ability. And that takes some juggling. Patty says that she found somebody to help with childcare. And as her son got older, she found somebody to step in. There will always be a ram in a bush. You have to just be able to see that. My, the young lady that takes care of my daughter has been with us since she was three months. That interviewing process was a little special. I have to say we interviewed lots of people as if I was interviewing for jobs at the airport. They came in every, every two hours. I had a list of questions for them. I checked them off, asked them to leave, and went on to the next person. But I did due diligence because I knew that I would have to depend on this person like no other. My daughter, who is four, is with Sharon right now at 8.30. So, but she loves my child, and I trust her with her. And so I say to you that you have to find people in your life that you trust with your child, and you have to be comfortable with that. And that's where the dependence comes, upon, comes from. I depend on Sharon, and she rises to the occasion. And I'm not really ever ashamed to admit that there is a big network of people that help me take care of the family. One of the young ladies that I spoke with about balancing her aviation career is our vice president of in-flight. She's worked at Delta. She now works at JetBlue. And Vicki has two grown children. And one of the things that she said that helped her always manage family and her career is that she made sure her children knew how important her career was to her. And she included them in things that were um, going on in her job. And I try to do the same with my daughter. She knows where I work, and she, from the time that she was two, she could tell you where I worked, and she understood about planes, and she knows about the airport. And I bring her to show her what mommy loves to do. Mommy loves you, mommy loves her job, and, it, and she kind of understands that there is a world outside of me and outside of her that helps to take care of us. It's the bigger universe. If, it, if I can impart one thing upon the women that are going to venture down the road of family and career, it is also that share your career and your passions with your children. Let them understand how important that is to you. Um, Vicki said that that was the one thing, in addition to her husband who really helped, she said that was the one thing that really helped her children understand why mommy was gone a lot. One of my other colleagues um, who said, I can't believe that you're really doing this, you're not the greatest example, ha <laughs> ha. Um, she said that one of the things that's been important or invaluable to her is the fact that when she decided to have a family, that she just made everybody understand her expectations as far as this is what I was going to do now, this is my commitment to work, this is how I was going to be able to work, and that she never told anybody that she was going to work less. She knew that she had to work just as hard, but she really let people know that no longer would she live and breathe her job. She would now live and breathe a lot of different things. And she said it's made her a better person. She said it's made her a complete person and she didn't realize how unidimensional she was until she had a child. And I'll share a personal experience that was very eye-opening um, for me. We had a, a family celebration for my cousin, and we took some, my um, cousins, we got together and we did a collage for her. And I noticed that I was absent from so many family photos. And Christmases had passed, and Thanksgiving had passed, and I was at the airport. I made sure my crew members ate, but I wasn't necessarily eating with my family. And that was a sacrifice I willingly made because I love my job. But when I saw that, it was very, very, it was a reality check for me. And what I realized is that as much as I love my job, I wouldn't have loved it any less if I had spent maybe one Christmas with my family or one Thanksgiving with my family. And so I, I say to you, as you're getting caught up, always have somebody pull you back and look at it as if it were a collage and clearly see what's going on. That particular message really helped me regroup 
and make sure that I put my life in a little bit more perspective. I don't love my job any less, but I love my family as well. And they have always supported me and loved me, and so I try to make sure that I give that back. And some of that is just in presence. It's not in, in physical presence. It's not just in a phone call or a well wish or let me make sure I send the good gift, but it's about being there. So when you're balancing aviation, which never closes, which is always open, there's a flight leaving somewhere right now. When you're balancing that with family, just remember that family really is important. Your job that you love or anything that you do that you're passionate about is important. And you have to get a support system. Somebody has to be the wind beneath your wings. So I am so proud of those who are getting ready to graduate. I'm so proud of those in the Aviation Institute. It is not an easy road, but it is not a, a, road that, a road that you can't master. And the fact that you've brought your families here shows that you understand the importance of the extended family. You might have to take care of somebody's child that you're sitting next to, so um, talk nice to them and, and make friends, because it really does take a village. And more than anything, I think the Aviation Institute and the students in the Institute, many of you whom I know very well, you all have shown it takes a family and that it takes a village. And you all are the example of what teamwork, working together, and truly caring about each other is. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today. Always put family first. Everything else will follow, I promise. Thank you, Isima. Um, I just wanted to build a little bit on what she said and say that I've had the privilege when we start about talking about networking and the extended family and the village that these two ladies um, have been of tremendous assistance uh, in my own personal career. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them and also to give you a living, breathing example of actually how this works. With that. We only have one gentleman on our panel. So you guys have heard about three ladies and their journeys in aviation. But it is uh, my privilege uh, to introduce the new director of the CUNY Aviation Institute, who's taking the helm, has taken the helm, and is moving forward. And that, my friends, is Dr. Robert Aceves. Uh, we. We here at the York College, it's really the CUNY Aviation Institute at York College, are very, very excited about his being here with us. We are excited about the vision uh, that he has shared with us, and we know that it's only going to be positive, and he's going to take this institute to the next level. And just like Isima and Patty said before them, we are also going to be the wings for him, that wind beneath the wings that will help him to take us all to the next level. So, and he has, again, around him, these wonderful gentlemen here, uh, Mr. Hodge, and everybody and all of you in the room, that it will be critical that you work with him to make this institute even a better place to be and an industry model. So it gives me great pleasure to tell you a little bit about Dr. Siva. He has said and has, is living it that he is equally comfortable in an airplane or in a classroom. He also understands the needs of first generation college students. A native of California, where his parents were migrant workers, Aceves grew up among the fields and beneath the crop dusters and you're gonna help me here, the San Joaquin, the Joaquin Valley, he recalls. As a teenager, he enlisted in the Air Force Reserve, becoming an aircraft mechanic and then a flight engineer. He flew the C-5A Galaxy, the world's largest transport plane, and the KC-10A Extender, a dual function transport tanker. In 20 years of service in the reserves, including active duty in the Gulf War, Aceves accumulated 10,000 flight hours and numerous decorations. Oh. 
He advanced in civilian life too, earning a bachelor's in professional aeronautics with a safety minor and a master's in aeronautical science and aerospace operations and management, both from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, a doctorate in school administration from Oklahoma State University, and, a, uh, and commercial pilot and flight instructor licenses for a variety of land and sea aircraft. After teaching for the United States Department of Defense, United States Air Force Reserves, and Spartan College of Aeronautics and Technology, he joined the faculty of St. Cloud State University in Minnesota as Associate Professor of Aviation, a post he held for 10 years. A CVS's research interests range from aviation management and online accreditation to aviation diversity initiatives and cross-cultural issues. With support from the United States Air Force, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, and the Alfred L. and Constance C. Wolf Aviation Foundation, he is writing a textbook, Chicanas and Chicanos in Aviation, Overcoming Barriers. His unique combination of scholarship and hands-on experience make him an ideal administrator for the CUNY Aviation Institute. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our new Director, Dr. Sivez. Oh. Yep. Hopefully I can carry this bio back when I have to take the, when I forget to take the trash out. <laughs> How do you know if there's an aviator in the room? They'll let you know. <laughs> well, you know a little bit about myself, a little bit about, about me. I spent 20 years in the Air, Air Force, uh, 10 years teaching higher ed. So as I, I was uh, driving here, the, you know, thinking, what do I want to talk about? What is aviation? I've had, I've experienced many of the pitfalls, many of the joys of aviation. I, uh, I I'm, I'm thinking about this as I rem I'm remembering waking up this morning at four o'clock with 16 other students that are in here, in Florida, as we're getting ready to board an aircraft from the courtesy of Ms. I see Ms. Gibbs, Gibbs here, to uh, from JetBlue to get out here by nine o'clock. And then, so I'm thinking, what do I have? What are we going to work? And I asked my wife, I can go down to the top 10 list. She said, no, we don't have that much time. <laughs> so I came up with a, a top five of what are some disadvantages and advantages of aviation. Probably top five. Number five, counting down, would be odd hours. You wake up early, you go to sleep late. Today's a good example, right? <laughs> I tell my students and it, the secret to success and many of them is, is only working half a day and it doesn't matter which half you work the first 12 or the second 12 hours <laughs> I mean that's pretty much uh, well, the advantage is that you learn to be flexible adaptable you develop planning and preparedness skills and when you're on an airplane you, you're thinking quick Emergencies crisis happen. I, I think that's, uh, that's one, of those, one of the advantages of those long hours. Number four, I said the, along with the long hours are, what else was I say? Oh, uh, <laughs> some of the work ethics. You can take a look at the advantage. You, develop, you go to sleep at night like you, like you will tonight. Right, you you uh, rest your your head's on that pillow, you know that you've uh, done an honest day's worth of work. You've represented the institution, the institute, the university. Kind of leading on to number three is, uh, and someone else touched about the pay. The pay could be better. <laughs> I've, uh, we sat down and looked at flight instructors who, who work 16 hours a day at an airport and they may fly three hours and four hours. And the busboy at McDonald's is making more money. Hmm. But the position is very heartwarming. You know you're doing good things for others. From in the military, from delivering aid to disaster-stricken areas, reuniting families. That's, you go to bed with a... With a a phenomenal feeling of uh, joy. And I just can't believe you just 
You know, they're going to make you a saint, <laughs> man, with, with the items you help. <laughs> Number two, we spoke about missing holidays. You do miss a lot of holidays, religious holidays, anniversaries, birthdays. But uh, you, make it, you do make an extended family. I cannot count how many seasonal holidays like Christmas or Thanksgiving I've spent away from my family. But on the flip side, I've never been lonely. I've always, I've always been welcomed into homes. I remember the, um, 17 years old, 18 years old, I'm in Spain. And I, a family took me in from the base, and I, still, I can still write to them. I can still show up in friends in China and say, you know, come on in. You meet other relatives that you haven't seen in 15, 20 years. I see a, a cousin of mine in the Philippines and a cousin, another one in, the, in Japan. I see them about every two years. Other places I don't go back, I don't see my parents in two years, but I see them on a regular basis. That's kind of the privilege or the, the benefit of flying. Probably the number one is relationships. We've, we've talked about that here, spoken about. They're very difficult. I mean, how do you maintain a, an 80-hour-a-week relationship with someone who's working 9 to 5? It is very difficult. Everyone in aviation knows a large percentage of family members who are single. There are a lot of casualties. But the benefits are you learn great communication skills. You learn that you don't know everything. You're gone for two weeks and you come back and the house has been running well. And my wife says, remember, you've been gone. You, it's running fantastically. And I show up and I say, OK, I'm home now. Stop everything. Drop everything. <laughs> and you learn that doesn't work. That's communication. With technology, you know, nowadays, when I first started, it was, uh, we didn't have computers, we didn't have the internet. Now, a year and a half ago, I was in, uh, yeah, a year and a half ago, I was in China. And every morning and every evening, I spent about an hour with my daughter. She was in kindergarten. In the, I'd get up in the morning and I would read her a, a book while she's going to bed. You know, in the morning, she'd, she'd tell me what she was going to do. After, after I'm ready to go to bed, she's telling me what she's going to do today, or she'd tell me what great things that happened. You know, I've spent um, 20 years here in all these pitfalls, and I've experienced every pitfall you could imagine, but also every joy. I now have the best advantage of my aviation career, and that is... Uh, sharing my wisdom and my experience with the students of uh, York College. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Mrs. Aceves and that beautiful young lady in the pink dress, the princess over there. So happy to have you guys here. My duties are just about over, but I would like to, I see uh, Dr. Griffiths walking out. I know he has so many things on his plate, but I would like to say thank you ever so much. It has been a grand pleasure working with you as you've worked with Mr. Hodge and VP Poseman and the president to make this institute what it is today. And I know you're only gonna continue to take it forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffiths. And I'd like to invite back to the podium the person who invited me to be here, and he's absolutely right. He said we talk once a week. We talk many times a week. <laughs> and it's about, oh my God, this project is coming up. This program is going on. But Michelle Hodge made this program his heart. <laughs> he put his honestly his life blood into it and Michelle we cannot thank you enough for what you've accomplished and I know every one of these students is your child so thank you again 
for your master, master contribution. And we know that you're going to be working with Dr. Sivas to take the program forward. So we know everything is in good hands. And thank you for this tremendous opportunity. And thank you to my colleagues. Thank you. Let's uh, please give our panel a big round of applause. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to bring up the presidents of our two aviation clubs, um, Salvador Saravia, who is the president of the aviation club at York. Uh, I'd like to ask him to come up as well as the president of Women in Aviation, Daisy Manzano. Uh, these are... They have a little uh, token for our presenters today. While they get those, um, I would be remiss to uh, not thank all the people who work very hard to make this happen. Um, many of you who've been around campus those who weren't sunning themselves in Florida for the last three days, um, <laughs> probably have seen a lot of activity, uh, particularly in this room. Uh, we actually had three, excuse me, four major events in this room in two days, all having over 100 people uh, attending them. One had about 160 people at it. And um, the staff of Cullinart, who uh, provided the meal for us, our B&G staff who, you know, kept coming and adjusting a podium and moving a chair and doing all this to the performing arts uh, staff who came and dragged all this equipment from the other side of the, uh, the world at York and is doing extended hours even though they have, uh, I think, three or four simultaneous events going on. Um, to security, being here to make sure everything stays in the room long enough for us to enjoy it. Uh, it, it was a, a huge, huge team effort uh, from the college support staff, and I think we should give them a round of applause. Okay. Um, with that, we want to uh, first present our token of thank you to Miss Patty Clark. Next, we'd like to thank Ms. Isima Gibbs. Okay. Uh, thank, next, we'd like to thank Ms. Uh, Philippa Carteron. And uh, before we bring up uh, Dr. Aceves uh, for his token, we actually have uh, two pieces for uh, Dr. Aceves. Uh, we were anticipating your arrival, and we've had uh, a shirt that we have passed probably through the aviation universe, and Shivanon is going to bring that up. Um, and with Daisy, who's leaving, I don't know why Daisy's leaving, but Daisy wants to. <laughs> and Salvador. And uh, could I have the Vice President of uh, Women in Aviation also join us, Hannah Mohammed? And they're going to present him not only with a little token for tonight, but the students starting way back in August started signing this shirt and leaving little messages on it for uh, Dr. Seves to welcome him to us. Uh, the shirt was provided by Mr. Henry Ray back there who uh, does all kind of nice things for us. It has a little, the little airplane there is a P-51 Mustang with a red, t red tail. Anybody know why that has a red tail on it? Just because of those two guys you see right over there. So They inspire us and they support us and we appreciate them being here. And so I'd like the officers of the club um, to come over and present the shirt and the um, award to Dr. Sevis.
Um, we are, we're almost at the end of our program, and um, again, I'd like to end uh, my time at the podium with a couple of thank yous to uh, some folks uh, other than our panelists who I really appreciate coming out on a Friday night uh, to be with our family here. Uh, hopefully it was a family night and you enjoyed the time with us. Um, but also, um, Provost and uh, Vice President Poseman have left, um, but they do a tremendous amount to support this program and to support the things that the students want to do and that I'd like to do and that Dr. Sevis is going to do. And also, President Keyes, who really um, wanted to be here. She had, she's had a marathon week and she got called away at the last meeting, uh, last minute. I'm not sure she's done working for you guys and for me and for everybody here. Um, so for those folks, along with Dean Rosen, uh, let's give them a round of applause for all they do for us. Um, many of us at the college, uh, we do uh, our work, um, and we work because uh, we like it and because of the students, and uh, we thank those who are here who are supporting the students and sending them to us. Um, but the students also, besides learning and um, traveling to Florida and Atlanta and playing with airplanes and air traffic control, they do a lot to help us um, get through our day to day. Um, and there are a few of the ones that work upstairs in the Aviation Institute. I'd like for them to stand, please. I see uh, we have one, two, three. You see the three young ladies standing right now. They work with Dr. Aceves and help uh, him get through uh, this adjustment period with us. And oh, there's four. There's Sarah. It's like it's four of them. There's Sarah the four, and so let's give them a round of applause for all of you. Um, I also have a few students that help keep me on track. Um, one of them, unfortunately, isn't, wasn't, didn't make it today, Faiza Parveen, uh, but also Gita Singh, who was Gita? Gita, who um, helps helps us tremendously and um, you know you, you, you probably should give Gita a little stronger round of applause because <laughs> just because besides working in, and helping me um, she really paved a really nice path for you guys to the Port Authority. She has gone two summers in a row and has impressed them uh, enough that they uh, they really look and are looking forward to more of you coming there. And Gita was the first one who was out there and opened that door for you all, so she really needs a round of applause for that. <laughs> now you may, you know, people say, well, Hodge, you're, you're everywhere, you're always here, you're always there. And um, the only reason I can do that really is because of two individuals. Um, and um, a lot of times, people hear from me through them. And uh, they do a lot to keep me on track and to make sure that uh, I kind of have a little balance in my life. And um, it's been uh, an interesting journey with them. Uh, we actually met right here in this room about three and a half years ago. And uh, they work tirelessly with me along with keeping up with their studies and uh, they have pretty good GPAs too. I'm surprised I didn't ruin that for them. And uh, they progressed well and they represent uh, the college well in many programs, both uh, CUNY sponsored, college sponsored and Aviation Institute sponsored. And whenever I need the troops, all the rest of you guys that I love dearly, um, I usually Say, Veronica, please send this text out to everybody. <laughs> and everybody gets a text, right? And then you guys pass it along. So she's kind of like the communications person. Um, often she goes and speaks with the president at places. And uh, she's going to graduate soon, and I'm going to miss her. But I'd like her to stand up and get a round of applause for her. So 
So we have somebody who goes out and does the talking for us sometimes, right, Veronica? But we have another person, and, and they came as a package deal, really. <laughs> they came as a package deal. It was, it was the best bargain we ever had at your college, I'm telling you. Um, and Jenny Chimbo, uh, she, she really has, sometimes I forget um, how much she's done for the program. Um, and uh, I should thank her like every day she comes in along with Veronica. Because if you look at some of the materials you have um, to, to reference today, um, they were either created by Veronica, coordinated, I mean Jenny, created by Jenny, still, three and a half years, I still mix them up sometimes. Created by Jenny, coordinated by Jenny, or maybe delegated by Jenny to somebody. Um, she uh, put the calendar together. She actually learned a whole new software package in the, over the weekend to put that together. Um, the poster that you see, we have a designer, and he did a pretty good job on the poster and your program, um, and we love him dearly, but he's, a, he's an artist. He's, you know, we're business people. Sometimes you gotta ask the artist to move at a business pace. She stays on top of him, and he does really good work, and she pro provides him with the, the material that he needs to produce uh, these things. And uh, they do all this while all the other demands on uh, their time. And so I'd like Jenny to stand and please give her a round of applause. For and I hope that um, the two of them serve as an example for how um, many of you in the room need to step up and help Dr. Sevis to continue to get the things, um, to do better things in the future, um, because without uh, the students that have worked in the institute, the students that have led the clubs, and the students that have worked with me, regardless of what title I should have for the week, um, you wouldn't have what you have here today. So please give them all a round of applause. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody because there are so many people uh, who make everything at York possible. Um, my final, I guess, uh, thing I want to say at the podium before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Service, uh, both, I guess, uh, at tonight and ceremoniously for the Institute, is that um, I, uh, I've been privileged, I guess, to, uh, to have been offered an acting position at uh, the college. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be right here. And uh, starting Monday, I will be the assistant vice president of enrollment management for York College. So. So. Thank you. Uh, uh, clearly, if it wasn't for all the people in this room, that would not be possible. Um, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, uh, it's no mistake that Jerry Posman said the things that he, he said. Um, literally, the experience that you have, we want everybody at your college to have a chance at that experience if they want it. And so um, my uh, position starting Monday will be a step towards trying to do that, joining the rest of the executive staff at your college trying to make that happen. I'm going to still rely on you all to be the example to the rest of the college and for you to uh, continue to do the good things you do. And to uh, the biggest thing I'm going to ask you to do is to make sure that you make uh, Dr. Sevis uh, more successful than you've made me over the last four and a half years. Um, and I'd like for him to come up and uh, close out our session today. And please, there's no rush. Please talk with whoever you want to talk with before we leave and make sure you get a good picture with somebody. And thank you all for coming out. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, 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 hold on a second. You're not ready to leave yet, are you? No, no, no. I, I okay, to, good, good. I, I got to pack up the, the podium and everything else. Well, come on up here. <laughs> you know, I uh, think I was getting away real easy. You know, a military person, we have a change of command ceremony. <laughs> the City University of New York Aviation Institute at York College, Mr. Michael H. Hodge, Inter Interim Director, 2006 to 2007. That was never mentioned that he had, he had uh, 
how the 2008-2009 in grateful appreciation for your outstanding service and leadership, sir. Well, spoke a little about I've spoken a little bit about heroes today, and I, as a military person, I cannot, I cannot get out of here without ha without having our ski gearman stand up, please, sir. Sir, I'd like you to stand up. Yes, sir. Stand up, please. <laughs> It should, it should go without saying that if it weren't for individuals like these two, I wouldn't be here. This little Mexican kid from California would not be here, neither would many of you. Here, here? Yes. On heroes, let's talk about the other real, real heroes. I'd like the family members to stand up, please. Because if... All right. And friends, and friends, family members and friends. Come on, let's go, let's go up, okay? As we mentioned here, if it were not for the support systems that you are providing, we wouldn't be here. It really wouldn't, would we? It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of effort. And I would like to also recognize, as for starters, the, six, the, six, the 16 students we just came back from Florida. Stand up. Let's get to know who you are. Okay. They started their day today at 4 o'clock this morning. Okay. And not just myself. They kept everything in line. Mr. Salvador and uh, Chevenon, they ran the place. I could never have had a better, better set of lieutenants in the military. I... <laughs> All right. Now, I'd like the rest of the aviation students to stand up. Please, please. Take a look. This is Friday night, and look at all the students that are here. Where are the rest in the world? I mean, that didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> but I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to express my appreciation for allowing me to be here. The privilege. I have the world's best job, and you hear me say that. I do. I mean, I, I just I have to thank you every day I wake up, and I, I love to be here. The, uh, somebody asked me, why am I here at 6.30 in the morning? It's because my wife won't let me out of the house before 4. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Have a seat. I want to I wanna leave this, this our, our evening tonight, with a little quote, a little Barbie uh, wisdom my daughter gave me today. Come on up, Ariel. Can it? Okay. So we're, we're discussing. She's listening. And she, she, we're talking about courage. If I may hear it, this one here. We're speaking about, here we go, I think this will work. Come on over. And we, we talk about true courage. And this is, so what is true courage, Ariel? <laughs> true courage is pursuing your dream even when everyone else says it's impossible. Say that again, say it again. True courage is pursuing your dream even when everyone else says it's impossible. True courage. <laughs> and, and, And where did you get this information from? Barbie and the Three Musketeers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to cite, this is a university, you know, we have to cite our roasts. <laughs> well, on behalf of the Aviation Institute, I, I hope everyone had a great evening and please stick around. 
Oh, we will, I guess we will have photos afterwards. with afterwards. Okay, thank you for keeping me straight. <laughs> we are. Um, we can go on pictures. I guess uh, the average student on this trip took 600 pictures. <laughs> okay, with that, I officially declare the ceremonies are even closed. Please mingle in and speak with another family member.